Well, things got worse again. Night reigns eternal, the Harvest Tide Festival turned into a massacre, and I can't get Candy Crush on my phone. So things are looking pretty bleak. On the plus side, my social calendar is packed. I got this wedding invitation in the mail. I don't know these people, but hey, free dinner. Can't hurt to stop by. Let's take a look at the guest list. Disturb is back. But this time, instead of humans that come back as spirits, every Disturb card is a spirit that comes back as an aura, granting the spirit's abilities or stats or both to the enchanted creature. Now, auras that pump your creatures tend to be bad and limited for two reasons. First, when the enchanted creature dies, so does the aura, meaning you lose two cards for one opposing removal spell or creature. Second, if you have no creatures, your auras may rot in your hand, leaving you with nothing to do. However, Disturb mitigates both of these downsides. It gives you card advantage when your creature dies, which balances out the risk of two-for-ones. And it gives you creatures and auras on the same card, meaning your cards will never get stuck in your hand. Unlike the Disturb spirits in Midnight Hunt, these spirits do not all have flying. However, this means they have better stat lines, which makes them good recipients for auras. Kindly Ancestor and Twin Blade Geist in particular make great targets for performance-enhancing dr- I mean, stat-enhancing auras. You can also build onto evasive disturbed creatures like Destructing Geist, Gutter Skulker, or Lantern Bearer, or make any other creature evasive by enchanting it with one of these cards. There are plenty of other good enchant targets as well. Steelclad Spirit is an efficient blocker that turns into an efficient attacker. Whispering Wizard and Heron Blessed Geist give you endless flying spirits. Dawnheart Geist gains life while clogging up the ground. And Storm Chaser Drake is amazing, as it has evasion and draws a card whenever you enchant it. You can get extra mileage out of your disturbed cards by putting them straight into your graveyard to bypass the body. Selhoff and Tumor and Scattered Thoughts are great for this, sculpting your hand and your graveyard. Fear of Death mills you while neutering an opposing threat, and Cruel Witness surveils on an evasive body. Now, the disturbed cards are not the only auras in this set. There are three others in common that pump your creatures. These combo well with Spirit Tribal, and their ETB triggers allow them to function more as instants or sorceries with lasting effects, which helps mitigate the risk of getting two for one. These don't work as well with Self Mill and do still run the risk of getting trapped in your hand, so don't run too many, but they can fill out your aura package if you don't get enough disturbed creatures. Cradle of Safety in particular is good for protecting your Voltron creature at an efficient cost, and for the same reason, Adamant Will and Geistlight Snare are pretty good in this deck. You may want to focus hard on this archetype if you find Hallowed Haunting, Brinecomber, or Catilda 2, Ectoplasmic Boogaloo. However, once again, you don't need to focus on Disturb to have a good white-blue deck. This mechanic is pretty modular, so you can include as much or as little as you like. Wow, Decay isn't invited. And Olivia invited Decay's best friend Exploit instead? Scandalous! Exploit is a mechanic found on some zombies that says, when this creature enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a creature. Now that sounds pretty good to me, but for those who don't like killing their pawns just for the fun of it, there is usually a bonus tacked on if you do so. You can remove opposing creatures with Rot Tide Gargantua or Big Daddy, counter a spell or ability with Overcharged Amalgam, destroy a Planeswalker with Graph Reaver, or accrue Hand Advantage with all of the others. Of course, this all comes at the cost of sacrificing a creature. The best thing to sacrifice is something worthless and replaceable. Things like Wretched Throng, Persistent Specimen, Bioloom Egg, or Doom Dissenter. Or the two-party system! Shut up, Doom Dissenter. However, if you don't have any such creatures on hand, exploit creatures can always sacrifice themselves to their own trigger, causing them to function more like a sorcery than a creature. Or you can forego their exploit trigger and just play them for the body. There's a lot of versatility here. But however you go, this deck is trying to win a battle of attrition. Can you make your opponent run out of resources before you do? Because you'll be trading off resources as much as possible, cards that make use of your graveyard go the extra mile. Patchwork Crawler, Cobbled Lancer, Skywarp Scab, and Blood Fountain all turn your graveyard into value. And just like the Disturb deck, you're happy to fill your graveyard with cards like Selhoff and Tumor, Scattered Thoughts, and Undead Butler. At the same time, you want to keep your opponent from utilizing their graveyard. Aim for the Head is a Mind Rot that exiles cards instead of discarding them, Syncopate and Bleed Dry are reactive spells that exile threats forever, and Honored Heirloom steadily purges the opponent's graveyard of threats or just ramps you into your late game. There are a lot of payoffs for this deck. 
Necru Duality, Arch Ghoul of Thraben, and Headless Rider provide endless hordes of creatures. Geralt, Visionary Stitcher, turns your zombies into flyers, letting you switch from defense to offense on a dime. And Dreadfeast Demon is just a straight up bum in any black deck, but blue black should be able to abuse it the most. Now, most of these payoffs are zombie specific, so do pay attention to creature types while drafting. Now we come to the Guests of Honor. Or Dishonor, I guess? The families of the happy couple. It is a party, and no party is complete without refreshments, so crack open a refreshingly smooth Blood Light. Blood is a new artifact token that says, pay one mana, tap, discard a card, and sacrifice this artifact to draw a card. That's right, Heirloom Mirror was just the beginning. Black's a Luton color now. It is not going to be hard to pick up blood tokens. Most of the set's vampires feature the mechanic, and many give you extra ways to use them. Fuldaran Bloodcaster turns them into flying tutus. Blood Tithe Harvester kills opposing creatures. Falconrath Forebear reanimates itself. Blood Hypnotist removes pesky blockers. Wedding Security draws cards. And Blood Crazed Socialite uses them to bulk up for the oncoming Endless Winter like a protein crazed gym jockey. As you can probably tell, Black Red remains as aggressive as ever. You want to drop a creature on curve every turn, and just attack and attack and attack until the blood rage clears, at which point you will hopefully wake to find that your opponent is the one bleeding out on the floor. Blood tokens are excellent resources for this deck because they give it something that aggro decks usually struggle with. Late game reach. Maybe you've hit your opponent down to 5 life, but now they've stabilized and you can't get through for damage. You need to top deck good cards to help you push through the opponent's creatures. Well, each blood token gives you an extra chance at a decent top deck. There are also a few cards that synergize with the mechanic. Discarding Edgar's Awakening allows you to return a creature from your graveyard to your hand, effectively drawing you a card for one mana. Ragged Recluse transforms into an efficiently costed beater, and Dying to Served turns your discards into 2-2 zombies. You can only trigger this once each turn, but since blood tokens activate at instant speed, you can do it on your turn and your opponent's turn to quickly amass a frighteningly large waitstaff. As with all aggro decks, you want to prioritize cheap removal. Gift of Fangs, Flame Blessed Bolt, Abraid, Markov Retribution, and Vampire's Vengeance all do a great job of clearing out enemy blockers at an efficient rate. Combat tricks serve a similar function, so Undying Malice and Sure Strike are excellent here. However, they are the only combat tricks these colors have to offer, so you can't always bank on getting them passed to you late. You may want to pour the blood wine if you find yourself mingling with such characters as Anya, Maid of Dishonor, Soren the Mirthless, Cemetery Gatekeeper, Voldaren Bloodcaster, Falconroth Forebear, Dominating Vampire, okay, basically any rare vampire. In case you didn't get enough of the mongrels in Midnight Hunt, werewolves are once again on the prowl. They still focus on the daybound nightbound mechanic, so you'd think they want to follow the play pattern of starting the day-night cycle, then skipping a turn to unleash their nightside wolves. However, there are three major problems with trying to make it nighttime. First, the cheapest werewolves in this set cost 3 mana, rather than the 2 drops from Midnight Hunt. Second, Into the Night is the only non-werewolf card that starts the day-night cycle. There's no brimstone vandals or obsessive astronomers here. And lastly, there are fewer ways to spend your mana at instant speed, so you don't waste your turn when you make it night. And even though the Wolves of Midnight Hunt had all these benefits, they still ended up as the worst draft archetype in the set. All of this means that you should draft this deck, assuming that it will never be night. Focus on playing creatures that are efficient even during the daytime. Fearful Villager, Oakshade Stalker, Hookhand Mariner, and Wolfkin Outcast are great places to start. You can play a more aggressive version of this deck by adding on some regular wolves like Runebound Wolf, Hungry Ridge Wolf, Spore Pack Wolf, and Pack Song Pup. Note that these tend to care about Wolf Tribal, so you'll want to pick up a lot of wolves and werewolves. Then, cards like Bramble Armor and Massive Might will help your wolves push through damage at an alarming rate. Alternatively, you can build this into a great late game deck. You can ramp with Weaver of Blossoms or Nature's Embrace, Curse of Hospitality or Glorious Sunrise give you consistent draw engines, and you can pour your mana into huge spells like Bramble Worm, Magma Pummeler, or Pyre Spawn, or into mana sinks like Olivia's Attendance, Ballista Watcher, or Child of the Pack. You may feel the call of the wild if you draft Howl Pack Piper, Howling Moon, or Howlana and Elena. Forget about Coven, training's the new thing in this season. Whenever a creature with training attacks alongside a creature with greater power, the creature with training gets a plus one plus one counter. To help them out with their training regimen, creatures like Hopeful Initiate, Parish Blade Trainee, and Apprentice Sharpshooter start out with only one power. Rural. The Recruit brings a friend with him to learn from. 
and Griff Rider and Griff Wing Cavalry can leverage their flying ability to train in relative safety. This mechanic keeps your creatures growing big and strong, but only as long as they have someone to look up to. Fleeting Spirit, Estwald Shield Basher, Donhart Disciple, and Sigardian Paladin are great role models. But once they have no more to teach, you have to get creative to keep training. You can artificially increase your creature's power with Arm the Cathars, Angelic Quartermaster, Drog Skull Armaments, Traveling Minister, Bramble Armor, Nature's Embrace, or Spiked Ripsaw. Seriously, there's a lot of ways to pump power. Now, it's always a bummer to spend so much time training new recruits just to have them slaughtered. So it's a good idea to put some training wheels on, like Allenbach Escort, Valorous Stance, or Adamant Will. Or at the very least, you can profit from their untimely demise with Light to Rest. Other great ways to draw in this deck include Cloaked Cadet, Resistance Squad, and Welcoming Vampire. You may want to join the ranks if you look up to heroes like Torin's Fist of the Angels, Hamlet Vanguard, and, uh, Sagarda's Summons. Okay, I'll admit that analogy got away from me. While the red-black vampires are debasing themselves, white-black wants to at least appear dignified. Instead of sacrificing servants, they're now more interested in gaining life. Now, life gain is fine by itself, but incentive never hurts. Markov Purifier turns that life gain into card draw. Panicked Bystander transforms from a mild-mannered tutu into a diabolical 3-5. Restless Bloodseeker creates blood tokens, and Courier Nubat raises a creature from your graveyard. So how are you going to gain life? Kindly Ancestor and Desperate Farmer have life link. Traveling Minister provides it in a steady stream. Gluttonous Guest gains one life whenever you sacrifice a blood token. Diagraph Scavenger exiles a creature from a graveyard, and drains your opponent for two when it does. Parasitic Grasp is a removal spell you would have played anyway, and Heron of Hope kicks all your life gain up a notch. As this is a more controlling deck, you want good defensive blockers, and many of the creatures we've mentioned already naturally fit into this role. But other good options include Militia Rallier, Dawnheart Geist, and Concealing Curtains. While Black Red is the vampire archetype, White Black also plays very well with blood tokens, but it uses them in a more controlling way. You can stock your graveyard with creatures to eventually bring back with Blood Fountain, Courier Bat, or Undead Butler, or discard disturbed creatures like Drog Skull Infantry or Twin Blade Geist to bypass the creature half of the card and just start putting auras on things. Bloodsworn Squire is one of the best candidates for these auras as she protects herself and is another discard outlet. If that's not Voltron enough for you, you can double down using the set's two card combo. Bride's Gown and Groom's Finery. These equipment cost 2 to cast, 2 to equip, and give equipped creature 2 power. If both of them are equipped to creatures you control, then those creatures get plus 2 toughness and gain first strike or death touch respectively. So if these are on the same creature, it gets plus 4 plus 4 and has first strike and death touch, which means it cannot lose combat. Yes, your opponent can use removal on your creature, but then you just drop another. This turns every single creature into a killing machine. It's a hard-to-assemble combo, and hard to say whether it's worth it, but if you get there, it will be a lot of fun. You may live the high life if you bump elbows with Edgar, Charmed Groom, Voice of the Blessed, or Markov Purifier. The Mad Scientists are still on the guest list, and still as spell-heavy as ever. Kessig Flame Breather and Lamholt Raconteur ping your opponents for one damage, Frenzy Devil gets plus two plus two, Cruel Witness filters your draws, and Whispering Wizard provides you with a steady stream of 1-1s. One now, these mad scientists are pretty open-minded. They'll trigger when you cast any non-creature spell, not just instants or sorceries, which means you don't have to shy away from artifacts and enchantments like other spells decks. Repository Scab is the only exception, so maybe shy away a little if you're running a few copies of this. But otherwise, this means you're happy to play not just instant cantrips like Chill of the Grave or Lunar Rejection, but artifact cantrips like Lantern of the Lost and Wedding Invitation as well, as they all trigger your payoffs while replacing themselves. For the same reason, Ancestral Anger is amazing in this deck. It's a one-mana cantrip that lets your ping dorks get in for combat damage. You want as many of these as possible, because they get more powerful in multiples. If you do go this route, Storm Chaser Drake becomes an incredible bomb, drawing you extra cards every time it gets mad. However, you can instead focus more on a counterburn strategy. Get down a Kessig Flame Breather on turn 2 to block, and then counter everything your opponents play with Syncopate, Siphon Essence, Wash Away, and Geist Light Snare, pinging them down the whole time. Anything that does get by your counter spells can be removed with Rending Flame or Lacerate Flesh, which can give you blood tokens to help filter your draws. And drawing is a big part of this deck. You want to make sure you hit your lands so you can keep casting spells to draw you more lands and spells. 
Inspired idea, scattered thoughts, thirst for discovery, and reckless impulse are all great ways to dig through your deck. Other evasive creatures like Gutter Skulker, Screaming Swarm, or Falconroth Celebrants help you slowly whittle down your opponent while spending most of your attention dealing with their board. Speaking of, Boarded Window also seems pretty good here, passively neutering your opponent's small creatures, though if your opponent has mostly bigger threats, it may be worth boarding this out. <laughs> You may find yourself channeling lightning into a corpse just to see what happens if you make questionable friends like Holebreaker Horror, Maniform Hellkite, or Wandering Mind. Once again, Black Green's theme is a bit of a mixed bag. Its graveyard value engine is still going strong. You can mill yourself with Crawling Infestation, Mulch, Undead Butler, Old Rutstein, or Moldgraf Millipede or just use blood tokens to fill your graveyard. There are lots of good payoffs for milling. Reclusive Taxidermist gets buff, Brambleworm is a massive beater that can gain you massive amounts of life, Retrieve, Blood Fountain, and Edgar's Awakening let you reuse your powerful creatures like Brambleworm, and Dollhouse of Horrors lets you make new friends. Black Green also has a Toughness Matters sub-theme. Catapult Fodder can fling your creatures at opponents, dealing damage equal to their toughness. Dormant Grove buffs your creatures, then flips into a creature that gives your board vigilance. Flourishing Hunter gains life equal to the greatest toughness among other creatures you control. Ancient Lumberknot lets all of your creatures that want to hit with their toughness rather than their power. And Unhallowed Phalanx is a common 113 for 5 mana. That's not a typo. But these are the only aggressive strategies at Black Green's disposal. Between Mulch, Dig Up, Reclusive Taxidermist, and Old Rutstein, Black Green takes the mantle of best color pair for splashing, which opens up a lot of new options. If you go for three or more colors, you want to focus on stabilizing early with efficient cards like Spore Crawler, Gift of Fangs, or Concealing Curtains, so that you will survive long enough to find and play your powerful splashes. And Hive Art Shaman is a good incentive to play this deck as well. Because this is limited and not constructed, you're not likely to be squarely in one of these archetypes. You'll probably play parts of each of these decks, but it's important to understand where the synergies lie. Oh, Audric's coming to the party. That's exciting. Hey, Audric! Oh, there's something different about you. Have you lost weight? Red White doesn't care about changing that silly day-night cycle anymore. It decided that was too much strategy and not enough hitting your opponent in the face. So now it's just plain old aggro. The most important thing for aggro is to hit your curve. The best one-drops are Voldaren Epicure, Kessig Wolfrider, and Hopeful Initiate, though the Vigilance creatures can be good if you have ways to buff them. At 2 mana, Fleeting Spirit and Blood Petal Celebrant are difficult to block, Drog Skull Infantry boosts your creatures to a relevant size in the mid-game, and Parish Blade Trainee can grow out of control. At 3 mana, Dominating Vampire swings a race severely in your favor with just one other vampire. Blood Hypnotist makes it difficult to block. Wedding Announcement and Welcoming Vampire draw extra cards while adding power to your board. Militia Rallier and Alluring Suitor are efficient attackers. Griff Rider is an evasive creature with training. And Daybreak Combatants is super important as a hasty vampire that turns on your training abilities on turn 3. Wait, this is a human? Even that girl in back? Look at those eyebrows! She's bearing her fangs, or teeth at least. Dude, I'd watch your back. She's definitely planning to murder you. Four mana brings us more hard to block creatures in Estwald Shield Basher and Lightning Wolf, more haste in Markov Waltzer and Creepy Puppeteer, another training creature that can grant flying to your other creatures, and another token producing enchantment that even has a slight chance to double as creature or player removal. This deck's top end consists of Angelic Quartermaster, a flyer who adds a lot of pressure to your board, and Pyre Spawn, which kills a creature when it dies and has enough power to trigger every training ability you have. You also want to prioritize cheap removal like Flame Blessed Bolt, a Braid, and Circle of Confinement, so you can remove blockers while still having enough mana to add to the board. As with all aggro decks, combat tricks can act as hyper-efficient removal, so don't sleep on cards like Adamant Will, Piercing Light, and Sure Strike. Radiant Grace is a cheap way to pump your creatures, and it comes back as a curse that makes it hard for the opponent to stabilize. And, if you can guarantee you'll have a lot of creatures out quickly, Arm the Cathars puts the opponent's life total on a very short timer, and helps your creatures train. Man, flashback's not coming. That's a bummer. That guy's the life of the party. That said, the game plan is still the same as it was in Midnight Hunt. Like the other Soul-type pairs, Green-Blue wants to fill its graveyard with value. 
there are endless cards that let you do this directly. You can also fill your graveyard indirectly by playing creatures that trade well, like Wretched Throng, Infestation Expert, Spore Crawler, or Rural Recruit, or by exploiting these creatures. As far as payoffs, Disturbed Creatures are of course good here, and also pretty much all the same ones we talked about before. Cobbled Lancer, Patchwork Crawler, Skywarp Scab, Reclusive Taxidermist, Retrieve. There's not much to say here because this deck plays very similarly to blue-black and black-green. For this reason, I think the most common three-color decks in this format will be green-black splashing blue and green-blue splashing black. There's just a lot of overlap. However, there are three green-blue cards that the other decks won't have easy access to. Vile Spawn Spider mills you each turn and sacrifices itself to create a 1-1 insect for each creature card in your graveyard. Winged Portent draws a card for each creature you control, which goes great with Vile Spawn Spider or Crawling Infestation. And Grolnok the Omnivore is a bit risky, because while it mills you and lets you play cards that you've milled while it's on the field, it does exile them. So if Grolnok dies, you lose access to those cards forever, unless you can reanimate him. Now, most of the payoffs for these graveyard decks care about having lots of creature cards in your graveyard. This means that you want to reduce your number of non-creature spells as much as possible. And without flashback, this should be a bit easier than it was in Midnight Hunt. The easiest way to do this is to draft creatures that do what your spells would be doing. For example, Diver Scab counts as a soft removal spell, so its status as a creature tends to make it better for this style of deck than Lunar Rejection or Chill of the Grave. Undead Butler tends to fit better than Blood Fountain, and Hiveheart Shaman is better than Cartographer's Survey. Obviously, these can't be compared directly. They're different cards that are better in some situations and worse in others, and sometimes raw power is better than synergy. But erring on the side of creatures is a great place to start. In addition to the major archetypes, there are always a few build-arounds that take you in a different direction. Patchwork Crawler gains the activated abilities of any creature it exiles from a graveyard. You don't need to build around this, as it's a good enough threat just by doing its scavenging ooze impression. But it's fun to try. Blue doesn't have a ton of abilities worth stealing, but the useful ones are Selhoff and Tumor's Rummage ability to keep your graveyard stocked, and Dreadlight Monstrosity to make your rapidly growing threat unblockable. White is the best color to pair with this. Fleeting Spirit grants First Strike, Heron of Hope grants Lifelink, and Unholy Officiant gives you even more plus one plus one counters. Additionally, it has Adamant Will and Valorous Stance to protect your Voltron creature. However, Red has some solid options as well. Hiveheart Shaman lets you pump out insects that get bigger the more basic land types you have. This means that if you can afford it, you want to run a single copy of each basic land, even if you aren't playing that color. Now the Shaman does give you a way to find those lands, but it's always good to have a backup plan in case it's too dangerous to attack. Evolving Wilds is a great pickup for almost any deck, and helps you find your singleton lands. Cartographer Survey pulls two lands from the top seven cards of your deck, and any Hiveheart Shaman deck is likely to have a lot of mill synergies, so Retrieve is a good way to get back a land you may have milled. Audric, Bloodcursed, is another rare whose abilities you shouldn't focus on too strongly in Limited. As a member of an aggressive color pair, playing efficient attackers is better than synergy. But if you want to go for this anyway, here are your options. And note that I'm only looking at commons and uncommons, because if you're playing this deck, you didn't get good rares. Flying is by far the most plentiful mechanic. You should have already picked some of these up. First Strike comes from Fleeting Spirit or Lightning Wolf, both of which cost some extra mana. Twin Blade Geist is the only source of double strike in the entire set, but the fact that it comes back as an aura means you're more likely to be able to keep it on board. Haste comes from Markov Waltzer or Daybreak Combatants. Stay away from Frenzy Devils, it has no place in this deck. Indestructible comes from Estwald Shield Basher, post combat for one extra mana, or after using Adamant Will or Valorous Stance. Heron of Hope or Kindly Ancestor can give lifelink. For Menace, there's Fearful Villager or Falconroth Celebrants. Trample comes from Belligerent Guest or Deadly Dancer, and you can find Vigilance on Unholy Officiant or Allenbach Escort, the latter of whom can also grant a couple of other abilities. White Red gets no Death Touch, Hexproof, or Reach in this set, so don't even think about it. The best way to keep all these abilities on board and make them useful is probably a Voltron-style deck aiming to put all of these abilities onto one powerful attacker. Then when you drop Odric, your reward for all your hard work and dedication is... A bunch of blood tokens you could have made by just playing red cards. Finally, I'd like to talk about the best commons in each color, just looking at the cards in a vacuum. This is helpful if you aren't sure where your deck is heading, so you can simply choose one of the best cards in your color, as these are usually solid in any deck of that color. 
White's number 3 common is Heron Blessed Geist. This is a passable flyer, but its power comes from giving you even more flyers once it's died or been milled. Number 2 is Fierce Retribution, which is as powerful of a rebuke spell as we've ever seen, and becomes unconditional removal in the late game. But it can't quite beat Sigara's imprisonment in sheer efficiency. Aura removal does line up poorly against exploit decks, but those decks also utilize creatures in their graveyard, so it's kind of a no-win situation. The blue commons are a bit harder to rank. There aren't as many standouts, but I'm going to put Syncopate at number 3, because it's an efficient counterspell that exiles, which is highly relevant. Number 2 is Skywarp Scab, as every blue deck wants to fill their graveyard, and this just draws you a card if you do it well enough. And Cruel Witness is another flyer that can potentially fill your graveyard and filter your draws. Now, I could totally be wrong about these. The exploit creatures are good, but there aren't many tokens in the set to sacrifice, so I'm not sure if they're universally good. Black is more likely to have creatures worth sacrificing, so Rottide Gargantua comes in at number 3. Removal is good, and that's why Gift of Fangs and Bleed Dry are numbers 1 and 2. I'm giving Bleed Dry the edge here because it's instant speed, and unconditional, and exiles the creature. While Gift of Fangs doesn't work against the most aggro deck, which is where these small removal spells are most useful. Firebrand Archer was very good in Hour of Devastation, and I expect Kessig Flame Breather to do similar work. It doesn't attack as well, but it does block, and even triggers off artifacts and enchantments. Most of the red decks want to put your opponent on a clock, and this is very good at that. Number 2 is Flame Blessed Bolt. It's the best parts of Shock and Pillar of Flame, just very efficient removal. A braid is a bit less efficient, but can hit artifacts and bigger creatures, so it gets number one. For green, Rural Recruit seems great, giving you two bodies in one, which can be exploited or trained or whatever you want to do with them. Number two is Spore Crawler, as we saw last set how good creatures that draw you a card can be. But of course, Wolf Strike takes the number one spot, doing its best clear shot impression. It's definitely not as good as Clear Shot, and like I said, you should assume it's never going to be Knight, but as it turns out, punch spells are still quite good. And as always, don't be afraid to spend a pick on Evolving Wilds. This card is low cost, medium reward, improving your mana consistency unless you're extremely aggressive. I really love how they leaned into the wedding theme of this set, giving us cards like Blood Fountain and Honeymoon Hearse and Wedding Invitation. It's just a lot of fun and takes the world in a new direction while still feeling like Innistrad. I'm really looking forward to attending the ceremony. I mean, pre-release. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give us a like, and if you want to see more draft guides like this in the future, remember to subscribe.